a mythological and evil creature from Antlers 2021 Explored. One of this year's most awaited horror movies, Antlers, definitely left its fans with jaw-dropping emotion. And not in a cute way. Right from the beginning of the movie until the last scene, there is a sort of strange, fear-like sensation that never fades away. And it leaves you wondering, oh, what's going to happen next? The movie is not just another dive into the supernatural world. It also slowly uncovers the darkness within both the protagonist. Julia Meadows, an elementary school teacher, played by Carrie Russell and Lucas Weaver, one of her students, played by the young Jeremy T. Thomas. It's much later into the movie that we find the true horror that is roaming in the forest of Oregon. Now here's something you didn't know. Antlers premiered at Beyond Fest in Los Angeles on October 11th, 2021. It was theatrically released in the United States on October 29th, 2021. It's a movie about darkness in all aspects. There's human darkness in the protagonist, supernatural darkness in the form of the mythological creature, and literal low-lit filmmaking darkness in its setting. The film is primarily shot in and around Hope, British Columbia. Directed by Scott Cooper, with the production muscle of Guillermo del Toro, Antlers is based on Nick Anostka's short story, The Quiet Boy. Since Cooper's Crazy Heart 2009, this is his first film without Masanobu Takayanagi as the director of photography. Also, Cooper's first digitally shot film. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Movie Story The narration at the beginning of the film is in the Ojibwe language, which is still spoken nowadays. The isolated town of Oregon that Cooper captures in the movie is visibly trapped in poverty and hopelessness, and that can be seen from the very beginning of the movie with buildings left vacant, half-painted concrete walls, and fields littered in debris. So, Cooper definitely gave us, from the start, a visual of what Terra looks like in the form of a dying town. What's remarkable about the movie is that it started filming on the 1st of October 2018, and by the 30th of November, the very same year, it was finished. Crazy, right? Well, that's what you get with a team that has both Cooper and Del Toro. Now, of course, its worldwide release dates got postponed due to the coronavirus. Safe to say, it kept us all the more excited. The genius of Cooper reflects in the fact that it's not just a film about a mythological creature from indigenous folklore. The emotional trauma of the characters is also at the forefront. Despair is prevalent in the eyes of Julia, who returns to her Oregon hometown after the death of her abusive father. She takes on a job at the local elementary school, teaching a classroom of unresponsive 12-year-olds. You would think that there would be much more enthusiasm in a bunch of kids. But oh well, it is this dull nature along with the eerie sounds that keep the stench of horror going for us. Now, Julia has her own issues to deal with, because along with the flashbacks of abuse that she suffered as a child, she also feels guilty for abandoning her brother, Paul who is played by Jesse Plemons. While she was away, he became the sheriff. And guess what? This is the third time for Jesse Plemons to be playing the role of sheriff. He previously played a sheriff in American Maid of 2017 and Game Night of 2018. Julia takes an interest in her student, Lucas Weaver, who is a rather quiet child exhibiting domestic abuse symptoms, which Julia is quick to recognize from her own past. She learns that his father, Frank Weaver, is a single parent with a criminal record, and upon finding disturbing art on his desk, she's sure that something's definitely wrong in that house. Much to our surprise, Lucas's case is nothing like Julia's. He's harboring a much darker and deadlier secret at home. That's when the audience sees Lucas killing and bringing home animals. And to think that a child lives like that, with bolted doors and a smelly and bloody house. That's scary as hell. But hold on. The scariest bit is yet to come. Paul begins discovering brutally dismembered bodies in the woods outside of town, and even the local coroner does not know the cause of death. Yeah, at this point, if you are thinking that the mythological creature steps in, just hold on tight. Julia tries to investigate what's going on at Lucas's house, and then comes the big reveal. This is when Paul and her stumble upon a local folkloric legend about a creature called the Wendigo, who feasts upon humans. And guess what? That's whom Frank is gradually turning into. 
Hence, all the animal remains that Lucas feeds him is only hoping that his father would get better. Unlike most horror stories that grapple into the world of addiction as the source of true evil, in Antlers we see that even though Frank ends up becoming the monstrous creature, he was a loving father and only wanted to take care of his sons. Exactly why he asked Lucas to keep him locked up, because he knew that if he was set free, countless lives would be lost. There comes a horrific scene where we get the first real look of the Wendigo with a mask-like face of Frank on it, who is about to attack his victim. If you're sitting with popcorn, well, some of those corns are going to pop right out of your mouth because that scene will leave you struggling for breath. With the emotional trauma of the protagonist on edge and the struggle Lucas went through to try and save his father and younger brother only to lose them both at the end, and the insane hint at the end of the movie that all is clearly not well when it looks like Paul might be showing early signs of the birth of a Wendigo. Antlers definitely has us on the edge of our seats. A mythological creature, the Wendigo, explained. Now let's take a deeper look and explore our mythological creature, the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a cannibalistic creature from the Algonquin myth. Why cannibalistic? Here's how the myth goes. It is said to involve a dark spirit that possesses a man and turns him into a feral, elkhorn creature that craves human flesh. The more it eats, the hungrier it grows, which is why the most common translation of its name means the evil spirit that devours mankind. What's so interesting about myths like this is that it almost seems so real. Like something like this must have definitely existed at a certain point in time. In fact, the Wendigo is known to live in Canada and the United States in cold climates. There is also a place known as the Cave of the Wendigo, which is near Lake Mamaguest in Ontario, Canada, and it is supposedly the Wendigo's hotspot. As most legends go, there are several physical attributes that are associated with this creature. It has glowing eyes, long yellowed fangs, and long tongues. They are also exceptionally thin and skeletal-like. Their skin is stretched so tight over their body that you can clearly see all of their bones. But the two most horrifying traits are its height and its antler rack. Legends say that it's about 15 feet tall. Yeah, that tall. Imagine being Lucas and having to kill it. The enormous antler rack allows it to injure and fatally penetrate the prey a look of which we clearly saw in Antlers during the last scenes when it gruesomely killed Paul's colleague, Dan, and left Paul brutally injured. The Wendigo serves as a very peculiar and fitting symbol of greed, hunger, and selfishness, among other things. The way it keeps devouring humans, yet its hunger is never satisfied. That is a clear reflection of how scarce resources or potential starvation could easily give way to our fears of cannibalism. We have seen pretty much everything about the way the Wendigo starts to take over the human mind and body, to take on its true form. Frank slowly starts to lose speech and an insatiable hunger develops within him. It affects his mind in such a way that he slowly starts to lose his sanity as a human being. The body is constantly cracking because it is preparing to adapt to the body structure of a Wendigo. And finally, when he feasts upon human flesh, it happens. He completely loses anything that is even remotely human about him and reaches the point of no return. Because let's face it, it's impossible to think straight in that condition after eating a person. It's curious when you think about it that the Wendigo spirit feeds off addiction and pain. It's almost as if it is attracted particularly to these souls. We have all the signs present in Antlers from the very first point where we see the birth of the Wendigo when the creature attacked Frank and his colleague in the mine which was their meth lab. And since the other guy was literally eaten off, it took over Frank, who is clearly an addict. Later on, when Lucas successfully kills the Wendigo that was his father, it took over another weak body. Lucas's younger brother, Aiden, who was already vulnerable to the Wendigo because of his illness, and in the midst of his own horrific transformation. In the end, we see early signs of a Wendigo in Paul, when black dirt starts coming out of his eyes, the same way it did for Frank and Aiden. And Paul was chosen because much earlier in the movie, we see him taking some medication. Although his drug use might not affect his work, it clearly left him vulnerable to the Wendigo. So, the creature basically reflects our own inner demons, and it is like a metaphor for how we are constantly destroying our bodies with drug addiction, opioids, drinking, and how all the generational trauma, emotional trauma, and child abuse keep tearing down our bodies until it reaches a stage from where we cannot ever recover. 
Much like how there is no going back after turning into the Wendigo, there is also no going back after you walk down the road of addiction. Now, let's get back to the narration at the beginning of the movie. It foreshadowed the creature's motives by explaining in the introduction that the abuse inflicted on Mother Earth released a malevolent spirit into the world, playing into the Wendigo's original essence. And that's why we have the arrival of Wendigo for the very first time in the mines, desolate and surrounded by darkness, ruins and in the dirt. It is reflecting the destruction of our natural resources. It is like the spirit of lonely places, of issues that people would rather not confront. The cultural ignorance of the protagonist about Wendigo's myth is very prevalent to how something that is so deeply engraved in the culture of the indigenous people is not even common knowledge to the people living in the town. And through that, Cooper opens up a whole new perspective on what a Wendigo embodies. In this movie, it is the death of a town with abandoned factories and mines. A rather gloomy place where people are leading monotonous lives with pretty much nothing to look forward to because it is swimming in poverty. An interesting fact about antlers is that the production employed a professor in the Indigenous Nation Studies program from Portland State University as the Native American advisor to give a better outlook into the film's vision about the deep-rooted myth of Wendigo. <laughs> Review Everything about Antlers as a horror is absolutely stunning. The dark, gloomy setting, the graphic of horror, and the production design are all superb. Antlers delivers a terrific performance by Russell as a woman trying to deal with her own dark past, leading the hunt towards the unknown in order to save the young boy, and the brilliance in young Thomas for executing such a difficult and emotionally challenging role is remarkable. All in all, a great mixture of the concept of domestic abuse stitched together with folklore legend and an incredible cast and crew definitely make it worth watching. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.